I just felt the Lord saying to me, this, this, it's, it's not a waiting on his spirit. That, that it's, a, it's an internal explosion of revelation. It's all within you ready to be released. It's, like, it's not so much asking God to push back the doors, but we, as God's voice, as the voice of Jesus on the earth, make our stand and push back the walls and kick down the doors. I'm going to tell you something. We heard, we just had a ser- just a series of victory, 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 victory. And, you know, we were at, we we're at, can I just tell you for a second, we were at the wedding last night. It was, it was uh, the, uh, the Witters and the Dawsons and Dave and Victoria, just a beautiful couple. They got married last night. And of course, many of you know that what we walked through with Karen Dawson, and she's going to be here next Sunday. I'm telling you that. We're going to rejoice. We're going to rejoice. But there, but, but there was that, that moment when you, they did the, the mother-son dance, you know? And there she was standing up dancing with her son. And all, all I could do is just, you, you just look on that and, and just, just about weeping because it's like that, that was a miracle. That's a miracle standing right there. All glory to Jesus. We had, we had Anthony and Corbin. They said, they said two months ago or a month and a half ago, it wasn't that long ago, and they said, Pastor, we feel called to Heidi Baker School, a missionary school, and we want to go, and then we're going to go to, to Nicaragua and do, it's a two-month deal, and, and wow, that's great, and we need $8,000. Okay, what's your plan? You know, that's, that's me. That's the practical side of me. It's like, Usually the Lord gives me a plan, you know, to, and, and well, you know, and, and we talked about a couple things. It's, it's like, okay, um, and they're just going to stand in faith for that. I'm like, we have a choice to make at those moments. And it's like, I choose to stand in faith with you. I'm going to stand in faith with you. And they a week ago, they had 6,000 yet to raise. <laughs> and and, uh, and, they, and Anthony had posted, he said, you know, we're going to go whether we have the money or not. We're going to go. We're going to shut that way. Okay, man. Go. And <laughs> so I'm standing with you. <laughs> and they stood up, and, and I, that, this last week, so many generous people have just given to them from our churches, give, give, give. And they left, and I think they were, and even after they left, they got a little bit more, and I think they were at 6,900, and then they're like halfway there, and, and another uh, dear sister from our church steps in and says, I'm, I'm giving you the rest. And so they got all the money they needed to go. And then Amani, I'm just giving, I'm just going to give praise to Jesus for a minute, because Amani came, and she's, she's wanting to go to Egypt, and she's, I mean, going to record 26 more messages for Arabic satellite television, and it's going to literally potential audience of hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. And uh, I don't know if you're the only woman on that, but you're like the only one I would trust with the message of the gospel. And uh, and uh, she recorded 26 of those messages, but she, she came and she needed all this money. It's like, I choose to stand with you in faith. And uh, all that you went through, come on up here for just a second. We just need a quick report. Are you, are you joyful? Yes. Okay. <laughs> he has made me glad. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord has done great things, and we were glad. It was an amazing trip. It was different than any other trips that I had to make because I hardly had to do anything. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. I preached so little, so little, just proclaiming the gospel. And then the people rejoice because I don't think they have heard that all they have ever heard. You do, 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 and the people are struggling. And I come, and because of the way I am, or the way God made me to be, when I proclaim this gospel is so real, 
is so real to me. I've become the gospel to them. And they receive it and they jump up and start dancing. And God starts healing people. And I don't have to do anything but I stand <laughs> and watch. It was amazing. Like the, the first day I arrived, the, the meeting was scheduled the second day. So this guy called and they said, we have a conference here. I'm part of it and I'm going to do a play there. If you come, I let you speak. I'm not prepared. I had 24 hours trip to get there and I'm so tired. But I said, I'll go. I'm here in Egypt. That's what I came for. I, I, I'll go. So I go over there. I don't even know what I'm saying. All I could remember, I just said about the prodigal son and how the father's love for him in spite of all that he has ever done to his father. The father ran, the father fell on his neck, the father in praise, the father put the ring. The fa and I preached like 15 minutes after it's all said and done. The one that made the conference, uh, the one who organized and the head of the conference, he came up and says, Every year we have the youth, they go into a different area. But tonight, for some reason, I just didn't want them to go anywhere. I want them to be with us in the main service. And I see cha life changed. And I looked at the youth. They were weeping, receiving Jesus. And I haven't even done anything 15 minutes talk. This gospel is so powerful. We have become the gospel. We are the gospel written in this flesh. Yes. And we have to go. We, we are the message. Yes. It's not something that we do. We have become it. And when we speak it, if it's real to us, it will touch people's life. There was a Muslim man that came, couldn't have, uh, couldn't breathe. He was really struggling. And he sat there listening to me talking about Jesus, the healer. All pain left and he felt free. And I said, Jesus healed you. Would you believe him? Would you receive him? He said, in tears, I would not be here if I have not believed. How much money would you put in just one life? One life is worth all the money of the world. It was worth the blood of Jesus Christ. We had testimony after testimony after I traveled all over Egypt. I went from maybe five, six different cities. And then we traveled to Upper Egypt six hours on the bus. And then six hours back to another city. And it was awesome. Every place I went, the joy of the Lord just filled the whole place. And Jesus did the work. I didn't have to do anything. It was the work of God. It was amazing. It was amazing. The only thing is that just... The enemy was so mad at me. I still have the scar in my hand. And I still have the sting of the, of the bag in my hand. And I'm still bruised in the inside. But I'm so joyful. I wouldn't trade it for the whole world. And I recorded 26 programs. It went great. Thank Hallelujah. you so much. Hallelujah. Hey, let's give glory to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to you. Glory to you. Wow, we got to have a hand in that. Yes. Hallelujah. I got to have a hand in that. Last, last, last night, there were about 500 people in the meeting. People just kept coming and coming and coming. And I prayed, like you said, I prayed for so many people that had fevers. And they had symptoms. Nobody wears mask on it over there. Nobody sanitizes nothing. <laughs> the dust is everywhere. And I'm in the midst of all these people. And where we live, the people downstairs, a guy died of COVID. <laughs> and they had a funeral. And people were coming in and out. And we're still in the midst and everything. But God has kept us. Yes. God has kept us. No evil shall be for us nor any plague come near our dwelling. The enemy wanted to take me out. The way I, 
of being hit is really hard. I should have bled and I should have died. I fell off the boat and all the, the steel has come deep into me and the bruise is still there. I could have bled and I went yesterday to the hospital a couple of days ago to the hospital. They had me checked out. They did a cat scan. Nothing. Nothing. Just the bruises. And to Jesus be all the glory. Hallelujah. Thank God. Hallelujah. Amani, we, we want to hear more. You need to you need to do a Wednesday for us. And I don't know if you're scheduled for that or not, but Dave will get you in. My mic's having some issues here. I don't know. It's just, look, it's just time, right? It's time. I love that. We are the gospel. We, we just take that to people. We speak over them. We speak truth over them. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good. Thank you for what you're doing right now in our midst. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're here. And you're in us. And we just want more of that. We just want to be aware and of what's in us. Call it forth, living it as our reality. For the healing of... Mm, for the healing of our families. For the healing of Tulsa. That they would know, Jesus, that you're real and you're the Savior. Thank you, Jesus. You're helping us move into this. Praise the Lord. Kids are dismissed. Kids can go to children's church and back that away praise God yes thank you Sherry you're going to come up and do announcements wow praise God praise the Lord If you abide in my words, if you abide in me and abide in my words, ask, and it shall be done. We've seen that this morning. Amen. We're going to see more of that. Praise God. We want to thank you for being here this morning. We want to welcome all of our guests. We're so glad you've joined us today. If you've never connected with us, we'd like to invite you to do that right now. You can text the word welcome to 918-551-7014. That's welcome to 918-551-7014, and then we'll just get connected with you that way. There's also some um, cards in the seat back pockets in front of you and the, the green one. You can fill that one out and drop that in the offering bucket on your way out. We'd love to meet you and get to know you, and Greg and I will be up here after the service today to greet you as well, so come and say hello. Um, we're going to give you a chance to give in the offering this morning. There's offering envelopes in the seat back pockets in front of you, so grab one of those, or you can give electronically and texting any amount to 84321, and we just appreciate your gifts, and, and uh, your giving today helps the gospel go forth, helps us to minister throughout all the world, and we send out a Manny to different places. We send out Corbin and Anthony, you know, they Speak sit rubber. here and they get fed and Thank they you. listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ and they take it forward into the world and your gifts help further that. Amen. We have the Meet the Pastors Luncheon today, right after the service in the Youth Center. I, I like Meet the Pastors Luncheon. If you've never done, if you've not been to one, uh, Meet the Pastors Luncheon, it's, it's free. You just, just go on back here. Sherry and I'll be there. You get to meet the rest of the staff. Yep. We get to just share a bit of the vision with you. We get to answer questions that you might have. You get to you just get to hear what we're about some more. So come and be a part of that. You got to eat somewhere. May as well eat with us. Amen. And it's going to be a great lunch. Yes. Today, right after service. Right after the service. If you've never done that, please we'll just come keep and you join an hour. us. I'm going to have to get ditch this mic. Okay. <laughs> And then this Wednesday night, there's a lot going on. This Wednesday night is our first ever Taco Wednesday. So I want you to come out for that. We're going to have free tacos. That's going to start around 6 o'clock, and we'll eat until about 6.50. And then everybody will be dismissed to um, 
their services, so adult service on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock in here in the youth center. Um, and then we have kids' school of worship for school-age kids. So that's this Wednesday night. Come for tacos. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then on the 31st, we have our Fall Harvest Festival for kids. Um, parents, bring your kids out and... It's really for anybody that wants to come. We're going to have lots of games and candy. I want to ask if you want to bring some candy to donate. Even if you don't feel like sponsoring a game, bring some candy to donate. We're going to make it an outreach. We're having some flyers printed, so we're going to go around and canvas the neighborhoods. But invite your friends and your family to come to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be Sunday, October 31st. And we've changed the time. We met and we started talking about it. We thought it would probably probably would be better to have it earlier in the evening. So we're going to do 4 to 6 p.m. on the 31st. Um, and if you'd still like to volunteer for a game, let me know. We're going to be meeting next Sunday immediately following the service, the 17th. I'll bring some lunch, and we're just going to get everything ironed out that Sunday and be ready to go. So I invite you to do that. Well, let's, let's bless our offering this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that you stand true, that your promises are true. And you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus, you said, if we abide, if you abide in us and we abide in you and your words in us, that we will ask what we want, what's our desire, and it shall be done. And so we just thank you, Lord. We say thank you in advance for the desires of our heart. We say thank you in advance for the provision for this church. We say thank you for the evidence of your love as you've sent Amani out to go preach the word in Egypt, and we've sent Corbin and Anthony out. Father, we thank you that you've gone with them, and we love them so much. And so we just thank you in advance for their provision, Father, for everything that they need. We give you praise for your, for your wonderful, wonderful way that you look after us. In Jesus' name, amen. That's good. I've got a black eye. I've had so many people say, did Sherry hit you? I, said, I mean, they're just joking, you know. I said, if she had hit me, it would have been a lot worse than this, let me tell you. No. <laughs> I, had, I had an eye surgery last, last week. Everything was great. Praise God. Um, I want to read to you the Word of God from 1 John chapter 3. Been in 1 John for a few weeks. We're going to just go further with this. I really think this is God's message for us today, okay? 1 John chapter 3. 1 John, not the Gospel of John. 1 John chapter 3. Here we go. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And the best Greek manuscripts have after that, and that is what we are. Yeah. And that is what, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever therefore commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So I want everybody to say, sin is lawlessness. That's important to understand this. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. I wonder if he was successful. Yeah, he was, right? He destroyed the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. 
for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Yep, the Spirit's going to give us understanding, okay? So I want to talk about this. This is all of a whole here. I want to talk about what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Because this manner of love, this God kind of love that God has for you is not something that we are used to encountering in the world. So it's different. It's so different that John had to say, open your eyes and behold this manner of love, right? So the question is, don't, you don't have to raise your hand here, but I'll raise my hand here for you. How many of you ever been kicked to the curb by somebody? Yeah, Paul has, Paul and I are brave. Well, <laughs> um, by somebody that you thought loved you. Well, it professed love for you, but you got rejected in the end by them, right? Um, maybe you did something to them that caused you to be rejected, but in some way there was some um, expectation that you didn't measure up to or, or uh, uh, maybe you weren't good enough for one reason or another. Or maybe you made a mistake. Maybe, maybe you're the one that harmed the relationship and that other person just can't get past it. Maybe it's a tremendous friendship that you have and it just got sunk, right? Maybe it's a relative. Maybe it's just a good friend. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it was your boss. And somehow you're just not in their good graces any longer. And you got set aside. And that is what we have found here in this world, the reality of a lot of what is called love. Right? That's the way love works on this plane a lot, oftentimes. You can shipwreck a relationship. And see, what we need to do is we, we need to try to exit our assumptions about what love is supposed to look like uh, exit our experiences of love on this horizontal plane in order to embrace a purity of love that you can only get here on a vertical plane with God. So God wants you to understand what manner of love he has for you. Because if you don't see the distinction, if you don't understand what manner of love he has, you'll end up taking your experiences of love with other people, which include you at times not measuring up. You at times getting kicked to the curb, and you'll bring that into this relationship with God. And it'll affect this relationship big time. And it'll affect how you deal with other people. It'll affect how you deal with yourself. It'll affect how you deal with your brothers and sisters in Christ, because with the measure that you judge yourself worthy or not of love, that will be the same measure that you judge others. And I've been on this, just on this journey, I've been asking the Lord and it just got, it just came, it was just coming to a, just like a magnifying glass this, this week where I just, Father, I want a deeper revelation of your love. And he's been showing me, but I'm like, Father, I want to know your love. I want a deeper revelation of your love for me. And I want a deeper of your revelation of your love for people. And so I've been praying that for myself. You know, whenever you pray, it's like Sherry asks. You know, if you, Jesus says, you abide in me, my words abide in you. You ask whatever you desire. It shall be done for you. You're, you're sitting before the Father and you say, I want a deeper revelation of your love. Yeah. He's going to say yes. Right? You're going to get that prayer answered. Absolutely. And that, so I'm just, so really what I'm doing is I'm sharing some things that have become living to me in the word of God. They're just plain for us to see, you know, to read and to understand, but they've become living and they become revelation. So I just want to share, share out of that because, I, because what I know that is happening is that, is that in receiving a better revelation of God's love for me, it absolutely affects how I treat my wife. It absolutely affects how I treat my children, my grandchildren. It affects, it affects how I treat the cashier at Walmart. It, affected, it, affects, it affects how I treat the guy that cut me off in traffic this last week. God cut me off in traffic, and he, was, he wasn't nice about it. He, in fact, he cut me off 
And then he used sign language on me <laughs> that I understood, and I don't know much sign language. <laughs> but something rose up in me. And you know what it was? Love for that guy. In fact, I like to step back and I go, Father, this is really weird. I have love for him. Like, I, like, I don't want to hold him accountable at all for that. Isn't that odd? That's not what normally would happen in me. So this thing's changing me. And so I, I prayed this week. I prayed, Father, I just pray for the, everybody in this church that would have a deeper revelation of your love for them, that they would get it, that you just start working big time on all of us here together. So, I'm, look, I believe that's going to happen, okay, to everybody that wants it. How many want that? All right. All right. Awesome. That's about half of you. You get to practice that on the other half. It's going to be great. <laughs> Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Behold it. See it. God's saying, look at this. Make an effort to see how different it is. Behold it. How do we behold it? And he says that we have become children of God. He calls us children. And it says in verse 2, it says, now we are children of God. Are you, are you a child of God? Well, is it now? I mean, I just did this stupid thing. I wonder if I'm a child of God now. Well, is it now? Well, now you are a child of God, okay? So if it's now, it's what you are. And this is the, this is the first thing that we need to see is we're going to understand God's kind of love. It, it is, it, it's the way that God has chosen now to define you. So we need to see that God is not defining us as a sinner who's been forgiven. We're not, I mean, now we are forgiven, right? We're forgiven. But the manner of God's love is such that he is not defining you by a negative. You're not defined by a negation of sin. Like I'm the old sinner saved by grace. I'm the old sinner who's been forget, forgiven. No, God is saying, oh, no, it's way past that. It's way past that. You're not this, this beaten down victim that the angels in a thousand years are going to look at and say, yeah, that's that old sinner saved by grace. You know, we should be good to him because we're in heaven after all. Let's be nice to him, you know. He's got his head down. His head's down and bowed. That's, that's absolutely right because we know where you came from, Bob. All right? No. The manner of the Father's love is, is so great. He refuses to define you by where you came from. So that Martin Luther got a revelation of grace, but he never got past where he came from. You know what he said of himself? I'm just a beggar telling other, other beggars where to find bread. No, you're not. I just mean he's not, he's not, when he sees you, he doesn't see, there's the old sinner, saved by grace. Um, Jesus did save us from our sins, right? I mean, thank God. He was the propitiation. Here's love, right? Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the satisfaction for our sins. Praise God, for God so loved, right? That he would deliver us. He is Jesus. He is the one who saves us from our sins. He did that. Praise God, he did it. He calls us friends. He says, you're friends. You're friends of mine. If you, if you do what I, and it says command. That's in, that's in John 15. Actually, that word in the Greek is entele. It's not, it's not law. The law command is namas. Do you know that in the Greek? I'm just telling you something. Because when he's saying, if you do what I command, he says, this is what I command, that you believe in me. That you believe in the Father and you believe in the one whom he has sent. So that's how, you, that's how you become a friend of Jesus. Okay? And when we receive Jesus and believe in his life in, uh, within us, he separates us from our sins eternally. 
as far as the east is from the west. And they no longer, they no longer, they will no longer, they do not have the power to define you anymore. He, he, he will not have us defined by what we once were. He, he will not have us defined by the negation of what we once were. So we're not all sinners saved by grace, right? You know what? Satan wants you to say that of yourself. Because, and the church has said that of itself so many times. We treat ourselves because it sounds like, it sounds humble, right? It sounds humble. Uh, sinner saved by grace. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. But you know what? That is the place... There's no power in that place. <laughs> there is pride in that. You know why there's pride in that? Because you're putting your opinion above God's opinion. That's pretty prideful. So he says, humble your hearts. And what, he's, what he means by that is, is, look, trade in your opinion for my opinion of you. Right? So a, a truly humble heart is one that agrees with God above your opinion. That other opinion is not a faith-filled opinion. It's just, it's, it's not your identity now. And so, so the Father is saying to us, he's saying, he's asking each of us to bow our hearts under the weight of his love. Bow your heart under the weight of his love for you. By saying what he says before him, I am your son. I am your daughter. I am not this thing even that I may be struggling with over here. I am your son. I am your, that's how you honor the sacrifice of Jesus. We have no, that. Father, that is my only identity in life. I'm not listening to Satan, the accuser of the brethren. I'm not listening to any other identities. All the world, you know, to heck with the world's identities, right? The, the, the world's identities are desperate attempts to find life in the flesh. We're defined by one thing. What the Father says. Father, I am your son. Father, I am your daughter. And in that place, we possess all the qualities of a son of God, right? So instantly, that, that prodigal son that came home was placed on him the best robe. Righteousness clothed him head to toe. The best robe. All the qualities of the son of God. You possess them righteous as God himself. Where's the sin in that? It's nowhere. You're not going to find that. I gotta find sin in God. And that's your true identity. And that's not pretend. That is your spirit man. That is who you really are at your core. If we could see you in your spirit man, who you are at your core, you would, you would, you would look like Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. It says that he it says that his face became so bright, his clothes became brighter than any bleach could bright them, but could could brighten them. His, it says his face became so bright, brighter than the sun. That means they could not look at his face. It was so bright. And then Jesus says in Matthew 13, he says, the, he says of you, he says, the righteous will shine forth like the sun in, their kingdom, in the kingdom of their father. Is he your father? Then in your spirit, man, your righteousness shines forth like the sun in his kingdom. So we're agreeing with him about who we are. Son of God, behold what manner of love that we would be children. And it just changes the way you, and, and we must change the way we view ourselves. Now, verse 9 of this passage in 1 John says, whoever has been born of God. Well, that's how you become a son, right? That's how you become a daughter. You're born of a parent, right? So whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Verse 4 says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin 
is lawlessness. Now, so I want you to understand this because um, people get tripped up on this. You're going to enter into a radical legalism if you don't understand what John is saying. Um, we're beholding the manner of God's love for us. That's, that's this chapter, beholding the manner of love. And here's what John says, and he just gives us the key, is that sin is lawlessness. So what happens is that people read these verses right here, and because they don't understand John's definition for sin, which is lawlessness, they bring all kind of condemnation on themselves. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. And then they say, well, I just, I just entered into this, this terrible thing. I just sinned. I just, whatever it is. So maybe I'm not a child of God. Maybe I'm not born of God. You know, maybe God doesn't love me as a son. Maybe I'm not really his child. John defines sin this way. He says, sin is lawlessness. Verse 4. Sin is lawlessness. And I'm going to tell you what lawlessness is. Lawlessness is this, and then I'm going to show you, okay? I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to show you. So lawlessness is not having Jesus within you as your life. That's it. Lawlessness is not having Jesus within you as your life. That's it. This is exactly what the Bible means by lawlessness. Lawlessness is not... I'm breaking this command uh, over here, or I'm breaking this law of God over here, and so I'm falling into sin. No, lawlessness is a state of being that you have no control over. You have no control over lawlessness until that time that you are born of God, and now you are righteous as your state of being. Jesus called the Pharisees, that he said that they were lawless. You know what an offense that was to a Pharisee who, I mean, those are fighting words right there, right? Those are, if I wasn't so full of the law, I'd punch you, Jesus. So, <laughs> instead, I'm going to crucify you. <laughs> I mean, we're not law, like you're full of lawlessness and adultery. And he's talking about God. Full of lawlessness. Lawless, lawlessness is a state of being without the life of Jesus. And John is saying, that's how I'm defining sin here. So you have to get that in your head. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17, he says, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. I did not come to abolish the law. Right? He said that. And that word for law in the Hebrew is, anybody know? Torah. I did not come to abolish the Torah. I came to fulfill it. And you know what he's not saying by that? He's not saying that, that I kept the law perfectly where you could not keep the law perfectly. That is not what he's saying. Now, he did that. He absolutely did that, but that's not what he's saying. When he says he fulfilled the law, I'm going to tell you what he meant by that. The, the Torah and the prophets are everything that God is mm, wanting to put into people, right? Everything God wants, everything God has that he wants to put into people, into their mind, into their heart, into their actions. Torah is the instruction of God to us. For Jesus to say that he is the fulfillment of the law means that in him is the completion of God's instruction for us. God has completed his instruction, and it's Jesus. And he says he did not come to cancel it. He came to fulfill it. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He, him, in other words, his life is, its, is the fulfillment in perfection, in spirit, of everything God has to say, every empowerment that God has for human beings, every intention of righteousness that God has for us, it's complete and fulfilled in Jesus. And that's what he means when he says he is the fulfillment of the law. 
So to have Jesus within you, to possess Jesus as your life, as your very life, is the fulfillment of the law. And to not have Jesus within you is, by definition, to walk in lawlessness. That's what John is meaning. You know what's fascinating about the actual word Torah? is So it's a Hebrew word. It is that the word itself, you know, the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. The, the word Torah itself points straight to Jesus. In fact, the, the word Torah is a picture of Jesus. You know, in, the, in our alphabet, letters only stand for phonetic pronunciation. So, you know, the letter D, 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 right? We learned that in first grade, right? The word F, and you go from, that's all it means. In the, in the Hebrew alphabet, every letter is, every letter, there, there is a pronunciation part of it. There's, there is an, an how you pronounce, but there's also with that a picture. There's also with that a meaning, a word associated with a letter. There's also a number associated with every, every Hebrew letter. Aleph, one, bet, two, go through the whole alphabet. So there's, there's this fullness of meaning that's around every single word, actually around every single letter. And the word Torah is, is, is made up of four Hebrew letters, Tav, Vav, Resh, and He. Tav, the literal meaning of Tav, the letter, is a cross. The literal meaning of the word vav is a nail. The literal meaning of resh is head or the highest person. Are you seeing this? The literal meaning of, of hay is, well, it really means window. It means to reveal. If you combine these, these meanings of each of these letters into a sentence, it, is, it can be this way. To a cross is nailed the highest one revealed. Or the Torah reveals the king of kings nailed to a cross. That's Torah. That, that's the word Torah. Jesus didn't come to abolish the Torah. He is the Torah. And to live... <laughs> in the fullness of righteousness, which is the completion of the law, is to live in the life of Jesus, period. Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection are all in there, all in there. When he says that he came to fulfill the law, he means I came to be the completion of everything God has to say and do about your life. So to have Jesus as your life within you, as your very life is the fulfillment of the law. And without the life of Jesus within you, all you've got by definition is walking in lawlessness. All you've got by definition is walking in sin. All you've got by definition is walking in death. It's the root of all your actions. To reject Jesus is to practice lawlessness. And that is true sin. If you abide in Jesus, you do not walk in lawlessness. Impossible. Because <laughs> the fulfillment of the law inhabits you. So verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin. Well, why? For his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. We're defining sin as lawlessness. That's what John's doing. It's not saying when you're born again, you stop doing stupid things. But, you know, John says he who has his hope within him purifies himself as he is pure. I mean, yeah, the, it's, it's, the Spirit's leading you to a greater and greater manifestation of who you really are. You're righteous. That's who you really are. So he who has that hope within him just, I mean, we're always looking to, right? Wow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop doing this stupid thing over here. It, so it's not saying that you're, that if you're born of God, 
and he's put his life in you forever and ever, that it's Im- that it's impossible for you to do stupid things. He's saying that if you're born of God and he has put his life in you forever and ever, it's now impossible for you to walk in separation from the life of God ever again, even when you do stupid things. For his seed remains in you. So once born of God, you're not going to be unborn. It doesn't work that way. His seed remains in you. That's... Behold the manner of love that the Father has bestowed on us, right? That's how he loves. No, in other words, no kicking to the curb with God. God doesn't kick to the curb. I'll just step back from this a minute. We're just going to get a little broader view of the implications of this. So we're to behold what manner of love the Father has. We're making it personal. Behold what manner of love the Father has for you. For you. I'm never kicking you to the curb. You're full of my life. You're full of righteousness. I see you as my son. I see you as my daughter forever. Except that John puts it in the plural. Behold the manner of of our Father's love for us, us. That means part of what it means to behold, to see the manner of love he has is to behold your brothers and sisters. We are to behold the manner of God's love by beholding it in our brothers and sisters. And this is exactly what John means when he says, look, you're going to tell me you got a revelation of God's love and you, and, and you don't love your brother or sister? I'm sorry. you a liar. You, don't, you have not beheld the manner of his love. You, you're not even in the first grade of the manner of love that God has for you. You better get under his love some more. You need to learn it some more. His love for you. You better learn that. Get a revelation of that. And then you're going to start seeing people. You're going to start seeing people the way God sees them. I'm going to say this backwards. So we've been, you've been, so you've been kicked to the curb by somebody. By what you thought was true love, human love, right? Whether it's by friends, what, or, or brother and sister in Christ or whoever. Maybe somebody who doesn't even know Jesus, but you know rejection. I Man, I'll tell you, I know rejection. I mean, if, if you could die from a broken heart, I would have died. And some of you have been there. Now think about that rejection in light of the Father's love. And Jesus is saying to you, because we're, because because we're beholding how he sees us, how he views us, how does he see us. Jesus is saying to you, if that person could have only seen you the way I see you, they would never have rejected you. If they could have, if they could have only seen you as I see you, if they could see your value the way I know your value, if they could see your righteousness that shines forth like the sun in my Father's kingdom, if they could see how much value you are to me, if they could see that, if they could see you who, for who you really are, they would never have kicked you to the curb. They would never have rejected you. Never. In other words, when they hurt you, they did not know what they were doing, for they were blind, spiritually. Same thing happened to Jesus. If those guys who crucified Jesus knew that they, if they knew they were murdering the only begotten son of the living God who created them, and who loved them before the foundation of the world, they would never have done it. What is the response of sons of God to those who are blind? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing.
it's a lot easier to let go when you realize that the person who hurt you is walking in utter blindness. What's our response when we're hurt? I'm talking about the compassion of God for people who hurt us. They really had no idea what they were doing. They really don't. They, they, are, they were blind. They are living in misery. You know, Richard Wormbrand, I, I mentioned him a few weeks ago. He's, he was the Lutheran pastor who was arrested under communism in Romania, and he, he was, uh, um, you know, communism doesn't allow for any other belief system. Um, and so he's arrested and tortured, and, and um, he wrote a book called Torture for Christ and has a ministry, and he's gone to heaven, but his, his, uh, his ministry is still, still surviving him. Um, and he said, he said the, the worst torturer he had, the one who made his, who did unspeakable things to him, he said, I could, I could completely see in him another Apostle Paul. He said, I just, saw, I just saw in him who he would be in Christ. And he said, I prayed for him and blessed him. We're seeing through a different lens now. Like, come on, behold the Father's love. It's, it's just easier to forgive when you realize people are blind to who, who they are and who you are. They just, they, they did not know. How could they know they're blind? I'm going to tell you, that's hell to live in that place. <laughs> you think you're making your life hell. No, they're in hell. Now turn around, someone in the body of Christ, a fellow believer, who's full of the life of God. Come on. They're born again. They're full of righteousness. Full of righteousness because they're full of Jesus. And they hurt you. Can you see them in the manner of love of the Father? Do you, do you see them? Do you behold what manner of love is there? In other words... As Paul says, can we look past the flesh to the spirit? Can we look past uh, uh, stupidity of actions that, that come from an unhealed heart? Just because you know Jesus doesn't mean you're healed up in your heart. It's the beginning of healing for our hearts. Can you see him according to the spirit? Can you see their righteousness? Can you see them as righteous and their righteousness shining forth like the sun, like right now in the kingdom of their father? Can you behold that? The son of God standing before you, daughter of God who just insulted you. His life in them as their life. I mean, would you dare go after them? Would you dare write them off? Would you dare? Would you dare write them off? I mean, can the eye say to the hand, I've no need of you? Or can we not rather practice righteousness, right? I mean, practice it. That's who we are. Let's get into something. Let's practice. When you see their value, see them different, beholding the manner of love of the Father for them. Can we, you know, it's, we struggle, well, can I, can I forgive them? It's like, what? Of course. I'm talking about honoring them. Can you honor them? What does that mean? It means covering their shame. It means it, it, it means they don't become the, go, the topic of gossip, though they may gossip of you. Can we honor? Can we behold the manner of love the Father has for us and enter into that one for another? Even when they're, when they're smart or when they're stupid or when they're generous or stingy or when they're up or when they're down or when you are in all those places to guard their reputation. 
to never write them off. That's body of Christ stuff. You see the sacredness of this? Behold the manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. John says, keep yourselves in the love of God, right? In other words, see yourself in God's love and see others in that same love. Behold it. You know, John spoke of himself. I'll just close with this. How does John refer to himself in his own gospel? He is the... He's... He's, he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> I am, he didn't say I am, he said the disciple that Jesus loved did this. He's talking about himself. I didn't know that when I was a kid. I go, what is that? I wonder which one that was. <laughs> it's like, no, that's John. Um, the disciple, aren't you kind of bragging, John? The disciple that Jesus loved. You know, all the other disciples were the disciples that Jesus loved too, right? He loved them all. They were all the disciples Jesus loved. John had the revelation, right? He was beholding the manner of love that was coming to him from Jesus. And he's like, all right, that's how you're going to define me. That's how I'm going to define myself. I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. And he bragged on that for all the world for the last two millennia to all of us. 20 centuries he's been bragging I'm the disciple Jesus loved. I'll tell you what, that'll do, that, that will change you. That will change you. <clears throat> he boasted on, on God's love for him. Peter, who boasted in his love for Jesus, he's going to boast on his devotion to Jesus. I, lo I love Jesus. I'm never going to deny you. No, I don't care what they do. I'll die for you. He says, anyway, and at the time of the testing, what happened? Where, here's the cross. Where's Peter? Oh, he denied him and denied him and denied him. Where's John? Right there. Right there at the foot of the cross. What? Mm. Mm. See, the greatest singularity of your life is God's love for you. The greatest singularity of our life is God's love for us. And so we do crazy things for each other. Incredible, generous things. Not just money, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. And we practice with our words and deeds, right? The manner of love that we behold. I have a few minutes yet. I think I just want to practice on somebody <laughs> who trusts me <laughs> you oh all right come up here you're too easy I just know you too well who else come on who else come on come on up Dave come on you two get up here oh I need help yeah, let's go down because, yeah, let's do that. And Sherry, get up here and say, hey, just feel, just feel uh, this step. Let's just surround them, okay? Come on up here. Let's everybody stand up. We're going to speak truth over them, okay? We're going to speak truth over Just stand behind one of them. Stand behind them. Do we have anybody that will do that? Yeah, come on. Some more. You can stand right in front, too. Let's surround them. 